Chapter 17 It's one thing to think about something hurting the one you love, to imagine it, to fear it, to dread it. It's something else altogether to watch, helpless, as it begins to happen. Bella's scream of pain froze us for an infinitesimal fraction of a second, and then we moved. I flashed to the couch and scooped her up. Carlyle's voice was loud in my head. Bring her upstairs. I flew up the steps, meeting Carlyle halfway. He carefully took Bella into his arms. Bella looked half awake, face cringing in pain, confusion in her eyes. Carlyle turned and moved swiftly up the stairs to his office. We all followed. I could hear Rosalie behind me, mentally screaming about bringing Bella into the office, but I ignored her, and she didn't say anything. Carlyle's office had been transformed into a high-tech hospital. He gently lay Bella down on the table and slowly pushed up her shirt to reveal her stomach. Her skin was already stretched so tightly over it. I was reeling with panic and fear. What had it done to her? How did it hurt her? Her scream echoed painfully in my mind. I watched Carlyle anxiously. His hands moved lightly around her stomach, occasionally pressing gently as his eyes studied Bella's face. Bella was wide awake now, having recovered from her unexpected flight up the stairs. She began protesting at once. I'm fine, I'm fine, Bella insisted, looking at everyone standing around her. It was just a little kick. It hardly hurt. I growled. Bella, you are not fine. You screamed in your sleep. We all heard it. It just surprised me, I guess, she whispered softly, looking at me. There's no need to totally overreact said Rosalie. Bella was glancing around the room now, and her eyes grew wide. What happened in here? Where did all this equipment come from? Where's your desk, Carlyle? Carlyle smiled a little, still examining her stomach. Emmett put it in the garage. This equipment is for you, Bella. We're not taking any chances. Bella shook her head, rolling her eyes. Then she winced. My eye shot to Carlyle. Ah, he said. His voice was strained. He moved his fingers, and we all bent closer to look. On Bella's skin, only faintly evident right now, a large purple bruise started forming. I felt a violent, twisting horror inside my body as I stared, frozen at the bruise on her translucent skin. It was already that strong. The mark terrified me, a wretched, muddled symbol of what had happened and what was to come. It had hurt Bella, and it would continue to hurt Bella as long as it was allowed to grow inside her. I noticed Jasper backing slowly out of the room, a hard expression on his face. The scent of the leaking blood of the bruise was permeating the air and had surprised him. His thoughts were fractured. Blood! Too strong! Get away! He disappeared out the door. I listened carefully to his mind to make sure he wouldn't return. Alice showed me a vision of Jasper standing by the river. Bella looked at her stomach. Oh! she said, her voice colored with surprise. Then she shrugged. Bound to happen, I guess. I sucked in my breath and stared at her in furious disbelief. Did she honestly think this was okay? Did she really think I was going to stand by and let this thing continue to hurt her? Bella saw the expression on my face. I bruise easily. Always have. You know that, Edward. Her voice was more sure now. Rosalie nodded in agreement. Bella, I choked out. Surely she must see must understand what this thing was going to do to her. I looked up at Carlyle, pleading with my eyes. Say something. Do something. Make this stop. Carlyle looked at me, reading my expression. I can try, he thought, unconfident with his chances of shaking Bella's resolve. Bella, Carlyle said softly, this is exactly what we feared, and this is only the beginning. The fetus will continue to grow and get stronger, and the injuries will only get worse and worse. There is still time to act, to try to get it out. I will make every effort, he paused briefly, to try to get you through it still human. A flickered memory of Carlyle's vision of changing Bella passed through both of our minds. Bella's eyes widened, and she looked confused. Get it out? But it might be too soon. He might not be able to survive on his own yet. A flash of pain crossed Carlyle's face. He looked down for a moment and then back into Bella's eyes. I didn't mean that it would survive, Bella. Rosalie hissed and put her hands on Bella's shoulders. Her eyes flashed between Carlyle and me. Bella's face turned hard. 
Why are we even talking about this, then, Carlyle? Her voice had an angry edge. I thought this was clear, decided. I am seeing this pregnancy through to the end. No one here is thinking otherwise, are they? Her eyes searched the faces in the room, and then rested on me. She looked at me for a long moment. My mouth opened. So many things I wanted to say, to scream, anything to make her see reason. Don't upset her, Edward, warned Alice in my head. She showed me a blurred vision of Bella's face, anguished and pale. Alice was looking at me, but I didn't meet her eyes. I pressed my lips tightly together for a moment and tried to collect myself. I reached over and took Bella's hand, holding it with both of mine. I rubbed my thumbs gently against the silken skin of the back of her hand and then moved my fingers along hers, feeling the delicate bones, the intricate joints. I folded her fingers over and brought her hand up to press against my lips. Then I raised my eyes to hers. Bella, I said quietly. My voice sounded rough. I can't let it hurt you. It was silent in the room, except for the steady beating of Bella's heart. I looked into her soft eyes. I looked for something I might recognize, something that might give me hope, confusion, doubt, or even fear, something that might help me change her mind. But her gaze was steady. I can do this, Bella whispered to me. Her face was intense, and her eyes moved to take in everyone in the room before coming back to me. I am strong enough to do this, and I will do it. You know that, right? I stared back and didn't answer. Her eyes narrowed slightly. Carlyle cleared his throat, trying to change the subject. The ultrasound machine will be here in a couple of days. We will know more then. For now, I'm going to take an x-ray, just to be sure I don't see any other injuries. Bella spluttered. Ultrasound machine? X-rays? Here? She watched as Carlyle pulled the portable X-ray machine over to the table. I looked questioningly at Carlyle. Internal injuries, possible broken bones, he thought. I clenched my teeth, angry again. This was madness. How could we just stand here and let this happen? Carlyle positioned the machine over Bella and took a few pictures. Then he suggested we take her downstairs while he developed the film. I went to pick up Bella, but she pushed my hands away. I can walk myself, she said, her voice cool, and swung her legs off the table. I looked at Carlyle in concern. What if she aggravated an injury? I think it's just a bruise, Edward, but I wanted to take the opportunity to get an x-ray, get a better look at things while I could. I glanced at Rosalie. Bella started for the door, Rose and I close behind. Suddenly, she stopped and lurched forward throwing up onto the floor. There wasn't much left in her stomach to come up. Both Rosalie and I shot forward to steady her. I was faster, and knocking Rosalie aside, took Bella's arm. Oh, moaned Bella softly. I'm sorry. Stop apologizing, I said quietly, as I lifted her into my arms and took her downstairs, Rosalie inches behind. Rosalie was more determined than ever not to let Bella out of her sight. I set Bella down on the couch, and she immediately rested her head against the pillow and closed her eyes. I wasn't sure if she was dozing or avoiding me. I watched her closely, waiting for any more signs of pain, another injury. Edward. Carlyle was standing at the bottom of the stairs, holding the x-ray film. His face was creased with anxiety. He motioned for me to come over. Bella's eyes were still shut, so I crossed the room to him. He handed me the x-ray, his expression pained. I looked at it carefully. Half of it showed Bella's body, her ribs. The other half was completely obscured. I touched it, wondering. The fetus is protected by some sort of outer casing, a womb, very hard and dense. My hypothesis is the womb is made of something similar to vampire skin. It looks like one of us would under an x-ray machine. I know the story you heard was that the creature would tear its way out. I think it probably uses its teeth to exit the womb. I stared at him, horror twisting my face. We can't let it get to that point. She would never survive. We need to remove this thing ourselves, open the womb with our teeth in a controlled situation if we have any chance of getting her through this, and we have a better chance if we do it soon, before the fetus grows larger and stronger. My God, I muttered. My mind was in flames engulfed by the vision of one of us tearing into Bella's fragile body with their teeth. It was excruciating beyond reason. And yet, Carlyle felt if we did this in time, we might save her. 
and I would do anything for that. Let's do it now, I growled, in a voice too low for Bella to hear. Rosalie's head whipped around, and she glared at us. She called Emmett in a quiet voice. Yes, well... Carlyle paused and glanced over toward Rosalie. Emmett and Esme had already joined her, and they were all watching us closely. I saw Bella open one eye and then quickly close it, assuming her sleeping pose again. I actually suppressed a smile. I knew she had been faking. Always such a bad actress. Hopefully we will know more with the ultrasound. That information will be critical. It will give us much more of an idea of what we're dealing with, so we can decide the safest way to proceed. However, he mused, if it is like vampire skin, we probably won't get an image. I nodded. The phone rang then, and everybody internally groaned. Charlie again, thought Carlyle. I went over to Bella. She had pulled up the edge of her shirt and was lightly touching the bruise. It had expanded and darkened considerably. The sight of it froze me. Bella glanced up and quickly pulled her shirt down. It's nothing, she said, smiling. I've had much worse bruises than this one. I flinched in horror at this, and Bella flushed dark red, quickly realizing what I was thinking. Of course she had not been referring to the bruises I'd inflicted on her the first night on Isle Esme, but how could I not think of it? How could I not compare those bruises to this one? I was responsible for both. I shut my eyes briefly, wishing I could erase both images from my mind. When I opened them again, Bella was looking at me pale now, and eyes horrified. "'Edward, I—' she fluttered. I smiled gently at her and shook my head. I leant down and pressed my lips against her neck, my hand stroking her hair down the length of her back. She shivered and sighed, leaning against me. Bella didn't cry out in pain again that evening, although I knew it was hurting her. She was clearly trying to control her reactions, but I could see it in her expression. She also got sick a couple more times. I sat on the floor by her head, singing her lullaby, hoping she would sleep and escape the misery for a little while. When her lids grew heavy and finally closed, I realized her stomach had grown far too large for her to sleep comfortably on the couch. I decided to bring her up to our room, to sleep in the bed. Rosalie acquiesced. I picked her up as gently as I could, but her eyes flew immediately open. "'Where are we going?' she whispered. "'Upstairs to bed.' I whispered quietly. She didn't protest. She wrapped her arms around my neck and pressed her cheek into my chest, the warmth of her skin laying right where my heart should have been beating. I carried her quickly up to the bedroom and laid her carefully down. She sighed happily, rolled over, and immediately fell back asleep. It had been foolish not to bring her up here sooner. I cursed myself for more bad judgment. Rosalie, trailing inches behind me, went to stand by the window. I glanced over to see Emmett standing in the doorway, leaning against the frame, arms folded, face dark. Apparently Rosalie had shared our encounter in the kitchen, and I had been right. He would not leave Rosalie alone, at least not tonight. He glanced over at Bella, his face softening slightly. He thought she looked so small, so vulnerable, lying in the big bed. He was horrified, by the sickness, by the bruise. He couldn't imagine how I felt. Couldn't imagine how it would feel to see Rosalie so ill, to see her in pain. But then he looked back, his face hard again. Whatever sympathy he might feel, he was also murderously angry with me for pushing Rosalie. Keep your damn hands off her, Edward, he thought. I narrowed my eyes and looked down at Bella. I was making no such promises tonight. Bella suddenly let out a small scream. Bella, I gasped, leaning over and taking her hand. Bella's eyes flew open for a moment and then closed again as she rolled over. I waited, uncertain. Then she cried out and flipped onto her back. Again I checked her, but her eyes were still closed, although her face looked pinched in pain. I realized that asleep, her guard was down. The pain that she had held in earlier slipped out. I stood, frozen, watching in horror as she twisted in bed, flinching and crying out several more times, still asleep. Stop hurting her, I begged inside. Leave her alone. Hurt me instead. Please don't hurt her. But there was no one to plead with. Finally, at some point in the night, Carlyle came in. He gently pulled down the blanket and pushed up her shirt, wanting to check her. Several more dark bruises were forming. 
My chest seemed to crush in on itself as I stared at them. I knelt down, groaning. Oh God, Carlyle, I whispered. He laid a hand on my head for a moment and then covered Bella back up. He turned to go, but Bella's body jerked violently and she cried out. Edward! My body felt weak at the pain in her voice. I pulled myself up and crawled across the bed, kneeling over her, my hands against the mattress on either side of her body. I'm here, Bella, I'm here, I said, my voice breaking. I love you. Her eyes opened and focused on me. Her face was strained with pain, and a tear glistened in the corner of her eye. One of her hands pressed against her side. I leant down, kissing away the tear, and brushed my lips slowly over every part of her face. Her eyelids fluttered and then closed, as she fell back into a restless sleep. Carlyle checked her again, and we saw the biggest bruise yet begin to form. I knelt back, pressing my fist against my eyes, frozen in anguish. Finally, Bella fell into a deeper sleep, and seemed to rest comfortably for a few hours without pain. Maybe it was sleeping, too, I thought grimly. But as rays of sun began to filter through the trees, her eyes flew open, and she groaned, clutching the side of her stomach. A new day of horrors had begun, and so the nightmare continued, as it intensified and darkened. Time began to pass in a blur, a haze of sickness and pain. In the morning, Bella was still unable to hold down any food or drink. The vomiting continued, no matter what we did. She tried to choke down sips of water, but it almost always came back up. Carlyle was beside himself over this. Dehydrated, malnourished. His thoughts screamed at me. We all watched, horrified, helpless, as Bella weakened. And yet, the thing inside of her continued to grow, sucking life out of Bella into itself. Her stomach stretched, terrifyingly large, and as the creature grew, it became stronger, and so did the pain. Bella fought to put a good face on things. She was determined to show she was strong enough to deal with this. She constantly reassured us that she was fine. She gritted her teeth to keep from letting a cry slip through her lips, but she couldn't hide everything. Throughout the day, she would clutch her stomach, breath sucking in, pain coursing through her eyes. Each time killed me. Her pain was a physical substance to me, an acid seeping into my skin, burning through my veins, shattering my bones, vicious and unrelenting. By the end of the day, I was on my knees, begging for her to change her mind. Bella, I moaned, my face pressed into the couch. Please, please let us help you. Let us end this. I can't, I can't watch you in pain any more. Rosalie hissed and leaned over, trying to push me away from Bella. But Bella waved her away. I felt her hand touch my head, smoothing my hair. I looked up at her. Her face was so thin. Her eyes were anxious, searching my face. She was actually worried about me. The world was a cruel, crazy place. Edward, he doesn't mean to hurt me. She stroked her stomach lovingly with her other hand. I pressed my face back into the couch. Bella, I whispered. Why? Why? If I had known you wanted a baby, I never, never would have put myself in the way. I never would have taken that away from you. I had not wanted to rip motherhood from her grasp. I didn't want to take away her dreams. But I did. I took away everything. Edward, she said. Her voice was earnest. I honestly didn't want a baby before, truly. I only wanted you, more than anything. You know that. And now? I whispered hating myself for asking the question. Bella looked pensive, as if trying to figure out the best way to explain something. I didn't want children. I had chosen my path, and nothing made me happier. But the first time I felt him move inside me... She paused and closed her eyes briefly, as if remembering the moment. I was... I was fundamentally changed. In that moment, I knew I wanted him. I knew I couldn't live without him just like I can't live without you. I want you both. But Bella, my voice choked. I couldn't look at her, but I had to ask. What do you think is in there? She sighed. I'll admit, Edward, I have my visions of what he looks like, but... She paused for a moment. When I met you, I wasn't really sure at first what you were. I just knew I couldn't stay away from you, so it didn't matter what you were. She ducked her head down a little, trying to catch my eyes. 
Do you remember when I said that to you? She asked softly. I nodded my head miserably. Of course I did. I remembered every word she had ever said to me. I remembered every touch, every breath, every heartbeat. They were all burned into my memory. It doesn't matter. I love him. Then she echoed her words from the past to me, and they terrified me as much now as they did then. It doesn't matter what he is. It's too late. Too late? It could not be too late. Never say that, my mind screamed. Never say that. Bella paled at the anguish in my face. It's going to be all right, Edward, she said quietly. That night was worse, an eternity of watching Bella thrash and cry out in pain. I felt trapped in a purgatory of torment, watching Bella suffer, powerless to stop it. I knelt beside her, holding her hand, whispering and singing to her. She woke up several times, and I kissed her face softly and sang to her until she fell back to sleep. Carlyle stayed with me this time during the long night, a silent stone pillar of support by my side. As dawn began to break, I noticed that Bella was too warm. She tossed uncomfortably, tugging at the blankets, and her hair was damp with sweat. I quietly got into bed with her, getting under the blanket, but being very careful not to touch her. I hoped that my cool body might help to make her more comfortable, but of course she sensed my presence and scooted over until her back was pressed against my chest. Her body burned hotter than usual against me. I laid an arm carefully over her, and she took my hand, hugging it close to her chest. I pressed my face into her hair, inhaling deeply. As I lay beside her, my mind went over and over my mistakes. I never should have made love with her on Isle Esme. It was more than that, though, I thought miserably. I never should have touched her at all. I never deserved her. The truth, as obvious now as it had always been, was that I never should have come back after I left the first day I saw her. I wondered why I'd ever thought a monster such as me could have the happiness I did with Bella without some sort of terrible consequence. And now, she was in pain. She was dying because of me. In the end, despite everything, I couldn't keep myself from hurting her. The agony and the guilt felt endless. They burned through my whole body consuming me slowly, piece by piece, as the sun slowly rose. In the morning, Carlyle suggested that maybe we might try giving Bella some medication, maybe morphine for the pain, and to help her sleep. Rosalie was immediately suspicious. "'Would that hurt the baby?' she asked, eyes narrowed. "'I'm not sure,' said Carlyle patiently. "'I think it would probably be fine.' Bella and Rosalie shared a look. "'Probably,' spat Rosalie. What kind of answer is that? Sounds too risky. I'm sorry, Rosalie. I've never dealt with a pregnancy like this before, Carlyle said, an exasperated edge to his voice. Bella, he said gently, this is your decision. Bella looked again at Rosalie and then shook her head. I ground my teeth. Finally, later that day, on our fifth day home from Isle Esme, the ultrasound machine arrived. Carlyle set it up immediately. It's ready, Edward, he thought. I was sitting on the couch. Bella laid next to me, her head on a pillow in my lap. She had been napping, the pain and her inability to hold down any substance, leaving her exhausted. Her hair was scattered around the pillow, framing her face. I stroked the dark circles under her eyes and brushed my hand gently along her cheekbone, too prominent now on her thin face. The creature was sucking away her energy, her health, her life but it could not touch her beauty. She glowed, as bright and lovely as ever. Her beauty shone not just from her face, but from her soul. I vowed I would never let it be extinguished. This was it. We would try the ultrasound, try to get some answers. If Carlyle's theory was correct, we would end this, today.